Okay, everybody. Um, welcome to another episode of the Fast Track webinar series. This is uh, one of the uh, sessions that we'll be covering throughout the uh, entire series, covering uh, basic setup as well as uh, the usage of many parts of the program. And we will have a couple open sessions later to go over um, various questions that have come up during webinars as well as ones that we have uh, received through emails to go over those things. So today's uh, webinar is about system setup, setting up the vehicles and vehicle types, uh, some of the things you can do with it, creating the licenses, um, as well as reporting what's available uh, within the system for those various things. Um, hold on here. Today, we have Adam, but Adam's not really here, so we'll just pretend he's here. Uh, me, Brian, as well as Eddie, uh, president, owner, uh, managing all the operations of Fast Track Livery Services. Just a reminder, the webinar controls, uh, audio settings, you are able to mute and unmute yourself. Um, we also have a chat available. This is uh, set up to chat uh, amongst participants. If you are going to be asking any questions, which we uh, highly uh, encourage, please use the Q&A option. Uh, that way it's coming directly to us and we can respond accordingly. Uh, towards the end of the webinar, we will open it up. And if uh, you have any questions, you can raise your hand and we can uh, make you uh, live to be able to speak to the entire group. Things we're gonna be covering today are uh, adding vehicles and vehicle types, uh, just the basic setup, uh, getting a full understanding of how those things work and what you can do with them. Adding licenses, license types to the various vehicles where you can add those licenses that you can then add to the vehicles to be notified about expirations on various items. We'll also touch on maintenance as well as maintenance cost analysis. And finally, we'll close with reporting. Uh, some of the reports you can pull out of there as well as exporting uh, various items out for further analysis if you want to. So, whoops, we don't need to deal with that right now. Let's go ahead and um, get to the, um, oops. All right. let's go ahead and get to the actual program itself um, and the various things we have in here. So today we're going to be talking, as I said, about vehicles and maintenance. Uh, vehicles and maintenance is located at the top of your program under the vehicles and maintenance section. By clicking on this and going into this area, you'll see that we already have uh, quite a few items already populated into here. The left side of this screen are your vehicle types. These are the types of vehicles that you will be selling to customers. They generally represent things such as sedan, van, SUV, 12-passenger uh, limo, items such as that. To add new ones or edit in here, click on the add option down in the lower left. And in here, you can add in the vehicle type that you would be selling to your customers. Again, this is a, a type of vehicle, not the actual physical asset. When adding the new vehicle in here, if this is a particular vehicle that you are not going to be offering online, such as a specialty vehicle. You can select the option here to do not allow booking in internet reservations. This can be later changed if you decide that uh, you later do want to offer that type of vehicle online. You can always go back in here and utilizing the edit option, change that. Color key, this is just a visual cue, as you can see down the left side here, of a type of vehicle. This is not anything that a customer or passenger would ever see. This is just visual cues internally for within the program. Setting a color, select any of the available colors. If you don't like any of these colors, you can certainly select any color within the color spectrum just by selecting the define custom colors and select any of those. 
once you've selected that color, that would be the color that would show up on the left there. Several things you do want to do, maximum number of passengers and most likely maximum number of bags. This is very important if you're going to be offering vehicles online to the traveling customers, your customers. Uh, this allows them to, when they're adding how many passengers are going to be in that particular reservation, if they try to put eight passengers in a vehicle that only holds two or three, it will tell them that it does not accommodate that number of passengers and they would have to select a different type of vehicle. Same thing with the maximum number of bags. You can select any of those options there. Keep in mind that if, late, if you leave these as ones right now and later go back in to offer these online, you would need to select these options here. We also do offer some prepackaged uh, images that you can utilize, and these are the ones that would show up online when the customer is booking the reservation. Uh, keep in mind, they're just general uh, views of a particular vehicle. They're not specific, but um, for instance, the uh, SUV Escalade 2018, if you select that, this is the image that would show up online. So the customer could have a general idea of what the vehicle might look like. Clicking OK. You'll get another prompt that says, uh, do you want to set up hourly pricing for this vehicle in your default pricing now? You can either say yes or no at this time. If you say no, when you get into the pricing area, you will have to set a price in there. But you can add one right now if you would like to. Just put in an hourly rate. Keep in mind that these are hourly rates with whatever minimums you might have there. Uh, and the whole pricing structure will be addressed um, in a future webinar. So um, you can either say yes or no at that point, as I said, and then go ahead and save that vehicle. It also prompts you if you want to put it into all of the other pricing plans. In this instance, I'm going to say no, cancel out of that and continue on. But that vehicle is now added over into the list of vehicle types here, as you can see. You can also see here which vehicles are offered online with the yeses and nos. And again, as I stated, you could edit that at any moment by clicking the edit button and changing that setting accordingly. You also have the ability within here to delete any of these vehicles if you want to um, by deleting them here. Uh, keep in mind, if you delete it out of here, it will be deleted out of all of the uh, various um, pricing plans, um, anything that you do with that. Over on the right side, we have our actual vehicles. These are the vehicles that would be added on to the reservations once you're assigning them to which reservations they need to go on. Over here, we click on the Add option. And in here, we would type in a name of a vehicle. The various examples that we have here are Vehicle 101, uh, the things that you name these vehicles, 101, 102, so on and so forth. Could be Big Blue, whatever you want to call them. In this instance, I'm just going to put 234. You would select which type of vehicle this belongs to um, by assigning it to that vehicle. It is then one of the physical assets that are associated with the actual vehicle types. Now, this is the minimum that's required to um, set this up. However, we do recommend that you add all of the other items in here, such as year, make, model, color. Capacity uh, did not need to be set here. That was, uh, oh, actually that does need to be set here, excuse me. Um, by doing that, um, it also helps when you're assigning vehicles um, within the reservations to make sure that you're not assigning a two-capacity vehicle to a reservation that's requesting 10 people in it. Phone number, uh, most people don't utilize that anymore. However, if you do have uh, phones that are associated with vehicles, you would want to put that in there. Text messaging, plate and tag, VIN ID, Current mileage, that comes into play later when you're dealing with the um, mileage. Um, I'll explain that here in a little bit. TomTom, -tom, 
Uh, if you are integrated with TomTom Tom GPS, uh, you can put that information in there. Some of these things, such as the plate and tag, can be sent out on the notifications to your customers uh, or passengers, letting them know which vehicle, um, making, in, ensuring that the vehicle that they think is coming to them is actually coming to them. Down below there, vehicle out of service. A vehicle that is going out of service, maybe it's going to a repair shop or not available for a while, you would want to mark it out of, v, out of service. Uh, you can also, by setting the options down at the bottom here, say a vehicle had to go to the maintenance shop for a week um, and you wanted to make sure that nobody would try to assign that to a reservation, you can select a start and end date on that. And what that does is the vehicle remains in the list, but you cannot see it when you're trying to assign it to any reservations. Um, later, when it comes back into service, you can mark it as being in service. So once I add that in there, clicking on the OK, you'll see that it now appears in the list of vehicles that are able to be assigned to reservations. You can also, at any time, as I stated, go into the edit function. And there are other things in here that you can do from within the um, vehicle setup area. Mileage log. This is a log of miles that are entered upon closing out reservations in the billing process. And that is something that would be addressed in the uh, whole billing section there. Um, we also have maintenance history log, which uh, enables you to keep track of the various maintenance items within that vehicle. Licenses, these are items that can be added on to the licensing. Um, any of these items, as you can see in the screen here, also has the ability to remind you when various things are uh, due. These things are set up in the list management area, which I can show you here shortly. Any of these things that are coming due, you can see you would get a message across the bottom that says uh, vehicle license expiration. By clicking on these items down here, you can see which items are expiring or hovering over it, you can see the various things that are expiring. Now, once they've uh, expired or you have re-updated them, you can go back in here and update these accordingly so those messages go away. Now, in order to add a license to here, you click on the Add License. You select one of the items that you have added into the licenses, um, select whichever it might be. These are items that you can add into the system, and I'll address that here in a second. So if I had various things like a uh, plate tag, and I could enter the phone or the uh, number here, set an expiration date for it. And then 30 days prior to that expiration, that is when you will see these messages pop up, letting you know which items need to be expired or are expiring. There is also a setting back in the uh, notifications that would email that list to you every night, letting you know which ones uh, need to be addressed. Again, if you need to edit it, you just merely click on it. Once you've got the uh, new dates on it, go in there and select whatever date. Now, apparently we're not doing very good at keeping up with ours because that's uh, almost two years old. But you can go in there and by uh, updating it to the new uh, date, the, um, the color coding would go away there. Brian, this is the, um, I think it's important to point out, you picked a good one there too, by the way, you picked on plate and tag number. And as you recall, the, the primary general information form on vehicles indicated you could put plate uh, or slash tag number there. That's not the one used today. That's a legacy function. It just hasn't been removed yet. The one you just demonstrated of adding plate and tag into the master list under menu will be the one that will show up in all the communications. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so again, through here, these are all of our vehicles. Uh, keep in mind that you can export all of this stuff out. So if you needed to export out this list to hand off to your maintenance team by clicking on the grid export, 
most likely you'd want to pull it out in Excel. That would then allow you to um, have the list of all of the um, vehicles and the items that are expiring on those. Some of these you can see don't have dates in them. Um, these are various items that we may have added in here testing things that we didn't put actual dates in. Other ones do have dates on them. So going back to where we set up those license types and to get them to show into the um, available items to add on to license or to the vehicles. If I go up here to the menu and I go down to my list management, uh, this was covered in the last uh, video of system setup and list management, but we'll address it here again. If I go to the list management and I go down to my license type, by selecting that option there, I now have the ability to add those various license types, which will then allow me to add them to vehicles. Now, keep in mind, this is a shared list that is used amongst employees and vehicles, but we're addressing the vehicles now. If I click on the add at the bottom here, I could type in the type, whatever it might be, the license type, set a date of when I want to be notified, whether it's 30 days or 45 days. And that is what cues the um, expiration notices that you'll see down at the bottom, as well as what gets sent in the emails. There are two other options here. Um, show this license expiration on dashboards, which shows that expiration date. I'll go back to that in a second that you could quickly see when it expires. If you want the item to show across the top, such as the 30 day license expiration, you do need to select the option to display it on the dashboards. Otherwise it will not be displayed on this dashboard. So what that's saying is that I can in turn add things onto vehicles that I may or may not want to show in these various lists here. There was one other item I wanted to address and we'll just kind of touch on this, but we do have the ability to um, integrate with uh, the New York City uh, TLC licensing. As you saw when I was entering that, I did have the ability to select either the uh, NYC Taxi Limousine Commission, um, which also uh, picks up on the uh, Department of Motor Vehicles for driver's licenses. If I select the Taxi and Limousine Commission, it uh, queries it and lets you know um, what's a, what is expiring or what has expired based upon their uh, licensing. So that is something that if you want to uh, address, uh, we can address that later, but just a, uh, letting you know that those are areas are there. Well, and not only, uh, Brian, not only for expiration of uh, a license, uh, a TLC license for a, a, a certain entity that you might be using in that tri-state area, but it will also um, notify you of revocations so that you're not running a vehicle in those areas that with a, with a uh, person who's got a license just revoked that you would not be, you wouldn't know about. The license would still look valid to you, but it's not. And the fines, the fines in New York, and I don't know how many on the group are in, in that uh, Northeast area, but um, uh, the fines are fairly stiff for using, and this is done after the fact. They'll, they'll look at that and have you submit for May about 30 days later. And if they find someone in that list, who had a revocation during that time period, even though the license expiration on your system was still correct, uh, they will find you for that. So it's, that's why the TLC reporting is important. It's free. Uh, we didn't build in a cost for that at all. Uh, so we encourage all the New York uh, operators to use that. Thank you, Brian. Also, uh, it does validate, uh, so if a, uh, in the drivers, especially if they were to give you a TLC license, you do have the ability to validate whether it is a valid license or not. Um, there is one other area in here, detail fields. Uh, these are just uh, items that you can add in here. Uh, they're just basic descriptions. Uh, these are all exportable items. They're not running any license checks or anything else like that. We've just discovered over time that people did want 
other items added into the list and we've just created the ability. These items again are added back underneath the menu underneath list items. Now keep in mind uh, everything uh, within here is exportable. I can export out my maintenance history log. These are entered in the costing and finalizing of reservations, uh, but you can export that out for further analysis. Um, as well as mileage log, those are able to be uh, exported out using the export function. Um, one other area that we want to cover within here, um, not only the exporting, um, being able to run and generate reports uh, based upon not only your vehicle types, again, which is on the left side here, but the actual vehicles, which are located on the right side here. If I go up into my reporting and stats area, as you can see, I have the ability to generate reports. There are various ones here. I can get vehicle type. And as you can see in the example here, it gives me the uh, revenue that was generated for each of those vehicle types. Um, you can also do employee drivers as opposed to affiliate drivers. And what that means is that uh, if you have uh, reservations that were booked as a sedan, uh, some of them you kept in-house and others you farmed out to other companies, that would be how you would determine the difference. Uh, if I'm just doing revenue by vehicle type, it tells me everything. If I do by drivers, it just tells me the revenue that was generated off of vehicle types for my drivers, um, as well as for the um, affiliate drivers. You can also, in here, there is revenue by vehicle, uh, which again is different than vehicle type. Vehicle type is going to tell me how much my sedans or limos made me. And my vehicle type or my revenue by vehicle is then going to break it down to how much each vehicle individually made me. So again, these are uh, ways to analyze data, just uh, determine which vehicles may be uh, underused, which ones may be overused uh, through the revenue by vehicle. Vehicle type just lets you know which types of vehicle types are your most profitable. There's also underneath the revenue and booking analysis doing the same things in here. If I go book bookings by vehicle type, select my date ranges, do my search, it's going to tell me how many times each vehicle type was booked this is no money associated to this. This is just a number of how many times you book those particular vehicles types. And you can do the same thing with vehicle. So keep in mind that revenue tells you how much the revenue was for the vehicles and vehicle types. And the booking analysis tells me the number of reservations which were booked um, for each of those vehicles. One thing I do want to uh, address now, uh, in here, if you notice, there are several vehicles that have a driver assigned to them. This is something that uh, I will discuss more once we get to the um, dispatching functions, but I will touch on it here briefly for you. From within the booking and logistics area, there's some options right here, a view on left or a view on top. By selecting the view on left, you will see that over on the left side of my screen, another window has opened up. These are uh, status of the various vehicles, what they're doing. Um, it would show in route, on location, mobile in there. Um, it also shows uh, flight information in here. It would tell me which driver is assigned to it and when they're about to um, end their next job. Just dispatching tools there that can help you um, um, figure out the best position for that vehicle to be assigned to. You can do the same with drivers, but you also have here the ability to permanently assign a driver to a reservation. So in this instance here, 
if I wanted to assign a driver to vehicle 102, I could go ahead and assign Maggie to it here by doing that, and she is now assigned to that vehicle. Now, what that does is every time I go to assign, oh, I guess it didn't assign her to that. Let me try that again there. Okay, hopefully that'll assign her this time. What that does is every time within the screen, when I'm assigning either a vehicle or a driver by selecting the option to assign that driver, if I were to assign Maggie to that, then automatically the vehicle would also be assigned to that reservation. Uh, this just speeds up dispatching if you have uh, drivers that are assigned to particular vehicles. You could either assign the driver or the vehicle to it and both of them will be assigned, assigned at the same time. You can go ahead and change out any driver just by clicking on it and then reassigning a driver at any time to that reservation. Now, you'll notice here that if I try to assign Joe Anderson to it, even though Joe Anderson is assigned to the reservation up above there, uh, it will take him out of the previous one and assign him to this vehicle by selecting that. Um, well, it should have. Oh, I forgot the option there. Um, but that way uh, it allows you to switch drivers between vehicles. Keeping in mind, even though a, a vehicle or driver may be assigned permanently to a reservation, you would still have the ability within the reservation to override that um, by selecting um, in here. I, it'll ask you if you wanna override that uh, driver to that vehicle. So on the dispatch grid, these are my vehicle types. These are telling me what type of vehicle the customer has requested. That is associated to these vehicle types. Also on the dispatch grid, the actual vehicle that I'm assigning to the reservation. These are my assets, uh, which again are the um, vehicles that I had set up previously in the vehicle area. In here, I can assign any of those vehicles. In this instance, I would select 101, click OK. A couple of things that you'll notice that occurred there. This particular one got a line across it because vehicle one is not a 12 passenger vehicle. It still lets me assign that to that uh, reservation. Um, there are times you may have to send a limo to a sedan job, but it's just letting me know that it was not the correct type there. So back in the vehicles, uh, we've got the uh, vehicle types over there on the uh, left side. We've got the uh, scheduled maintenance. This allows you to set up maintenance items for each of the vehicles. Over on the left side, I have the ability to add various items. I could have um, oil change, belts, tire rotations, such as I see over here. And then for the vehicle itself, I have the ability to add those items to it. So if I were to click on the edit option there, I can then add in tire rotation, belts, whatever they might be, set a uh, date when it's due, and those things will then appear down here, not in the vehicle license area, which is the one here, but they will appear down here in the vehicle maintenance reminder. Um, by selecting that, it would take me into this window, letting me know which items are due for various maintenance items. Again, this left side allows you to add any item you want. The right side lets you add to particular vehicles what items you wanna add in there. There's also another tab in here called the maintenance cost analysis. This is just basically a grid letting you know costs that you have associated as well as to which vehicles. As you can see, vehicle 202 had a $35 uh, tire rotation. We don't have a lot of things in here, but, or you could do it by vehicle type as well. It'll tell you the uh, S classes have had that much uh, maintenance items added to them or by the vehicle. Um, again, this can be exported out for further analysis or handing off to a maintenance uh, team if you need to. Um, we also have in here, whoops, 
um, the ability to whether you want to look at uh, different things such as deleted vehicles, out of service vehicles, uh, the various things in there. So that pretty much covers all of the vehicle and maintenance items, setting up the vehicles, vehicle types. Uh, these are all then usable within the uh, reservations. Keep in mind, if you are just starting to utilize the program, you will want to set up the vehicles and uh, vehicle types before proceeding anywhere else in the program, um, namely because your employee payroll is all tied into this as well as all of your, or, um, your pricing structure is all built off of the um, vehicle types. So before proceeding into the uh, pricing structure, you have to start with the vehicle types um, as well as the employee payroll. Uh, I think that pretty much covers most of this section. Eddie, do you have anything you'd like to add right now? Eddie? No? Okay. So I, I don't. I, the the Q&A screen covered up my video, so I apologize. I don't. Okay. All right. So uh, as I said, I think that pretty much covers most of the vehicles and maintenance area there. Uh, do we have any uh, questions or anything else out there we need to address? Um, I know that... Uh, Raise your hands if you do. A couple of people are out there. Any questions? Okay. Just keep going. Huh? Just keep on going. All right. Um, some of the uh, areas where uh, this stuff uh, applies into, again, we've set up most of these things here. Just a general review of when I'm adding reservations uh, within the reservation. Um, again, a lot of this area will be test or um, gone over in more detail in other areas there. But if I were to come into a particular vehicle or a reservation here, selecting my ground arrival or departures, selecting my date of it. As you'll notice over here on the right side, this is where I'm setting the vehicle type that uh, is going to be um, added on to that uh, reservation there. Um, you also have the ability within a customer profile. I'll jump over to oh, that. Brian, Brian, mm -hmm. point out the, the number of passengers there that it would be um, validated. Just go into any any open any booking on your grid, save yeah. time. I should have addressed that. Sorry. Yeah. Um, again, once I'm in here and I'm selecting my date, uh, right here is the option to add number of passengers as well as number of bags to this reservation. Now, what this does is if I put 24 passengers in that uh, vehicle and I've got 26 bags in there. Um, if I try to assign that to a sedan, but continuing through that, it is telling me before I proceed here that I have more passengers and bags in that vehicle than that particular vehicle type would allow uh, for that reservation. So basically it's stopping the reservation at this point and either correcting the number of passengers or bags, maybe they selected the wrong thing, or they selected the uh, improper vehicle type over here. Now you do have the ability to continue through this. Um, you can say no and it'll let you go on, um, or you can say yes, I'm sorry. If you say yes, it'll let you go on and save that. Uh, keep in mind that uh, oops, it's trying to save a reservation there for me. Um, that number right there is checking against the number of bags and um, passengers. It's comparing it again over to here, looking at this number here. So if I had 25 here, it would allow me to put 25 in there. If I had 25 bags, it would allow me to put 25 bags in there. 
So that's where the, um, this validation is, is coming. It's actually validating it two places. It's validating it when you're trying to save a reservation internally, as well as online as to which vehicles would be available for the uh, traveling customer to book uh, the reservation on. Um, I think I saw somebody, Glenn had a question, I believe. Well, all right. Um, <laughs> okay, Glenn. We'll, uh, we'll let that go this time. All right. Um, I think, again, we're uh, pretty much got everything covered there. Uh, this, uh, this session uh, pretty much covers all of the vehicles and maintenance things there, um, as well as assigning them in reservations, uh, setting up, uh, let me touch on the customer corporate profile here. I did address this, but let me review it here. Within a customer profile, you have the ability to set their default vehicle. And what that does is if I set this customer to utilize a SUV as set up in the vehicle types, every time I go to book a reservation, that would be the default vehicle that is populated into the reservation. You can always change that. Um, however, if a majority of the time they're taking sedans or SUVs, you would want to select a particular vehicle type. It also affects pricing um, based upon what their pricing plans are. Pricing plans will be addressed in the uh, pricing um, semi or, um, webinar, but just letting you know you can set that particular stuff in there. Um, Another thing, I guess, now that we can think about this. Um, also, uh, based upon what type of vehicle you're assigning to a reservation, that information is also displayed onto confirmations. If I view this confirmation here, it will state that it is a uh, 12 passenger limo in that instance there, letting the customer know, for instance, right here, it says vehicle type, 12 passenger limo. Just again, a verification back to the customer that the type of vehicle that they have requested is the actual type of vehicle that uh, you have built into the reservation. As you notice in here, there is no actual vehicle assigned to a reservation. Most of the time when we're booking the reservation, we don't know which vehicle is going to be assigned to it. However, later when we do assign the vehicle, that information is passed to a driver so if I were to look at the uh, trip ticket in here, that driver would have two bits of information. They would have the vehicle type as well as the actual vehicle that they were assigned to in there, letting them also make sure that they have the correct vehicle, which should be going out with that. Uh, vehicle type, is also sent on the um, various notifications that go out to the customers, letting them know that they have been, um, um, a reservation has been booked for a particular vehicle. One the thing I- also shows up, Brian, on the driver apps. And on the, the driver apps. apps. Mm -hmm. um, and, also and the in, here, in here, in the system global settings, I did touch on this, but let's go ahead and address it from here. Underneath the notifications, the licensing. In here, you can set up for every night at midnight for yourself or whomever within the organization to be emailed a list of the licenses which are expiring um, on both employees and vehicles. That list that would be sent to you would coincide with the list in here of all of the expirations. So in this instance, every night at midnight, we, we would be receiving a list of all of the um, vehicles that are expiring. Um, that way somebody could go in and address them, um, update them, make any changes accordingly that they need to make to those various items there. Um, I don't think there's any other notifications. Well, hold on, let me address that one other one. 
if we go back into the notifications, in here, you'll recall in the previous webinar, there is the ability to send the vehicle information on these things, the pre-trip reminders. Uh, it would send the make and model, I guess, make and color and plate uh, to the customer, uh, letting them know it's a um, Lincoln Town Car black and the license plate on it. Um, some people utilize this, some people uh, don't. Uh, it is a good method to ensure your passenger, your traveling passenger, that somebody is not out there trying to pick up your people. They can verify when the vehicle pulls up, which ve that, that, that is actually the vehicle from your company. It would send the make, color, and plate number. Same thing with the in process. You can send that uh, plate, the make, color and plate uh, with it also, letting them uh, be assured that the vehicle that has pulled up and said it is for them, that it is actually for them. And Brian, while, while you're there, let's go on into the web services tab. One of the things that, that I find a lot, and I get a lot of questions uh, with those of you that are dealing with any um, API or web service third-party integrations, and those could be things from Limo Link to Carry International to GroundSpan to uh, Deem Affiliate Connect to Deem Saturn, uh, GNET, any of these entities that are communicating with you other than through you typing a reservation. If they're coming, those, those reservations just appearing uh, through what we call uh, the, the API uh, web services backdoor. I like to refer to it as they didn't come in the front door, they came in the back door. As these are electronically transmitted, it's really important that that you have a correlation between the common list, and this is a list that was designed 20 years ago or so uh, by Deem. It's been adopted as kind of the standard correlation between what some third party calls a sedan and what you call a sedan, so that there can be a proper mapping. And in order to do that, we have this screen, which helps you map either primary, secondary, or tertiary vehicle types in the list to a, a vehicle type that you carry. So in, in this case, a 12 passenger might be, a 12 packs limo that you have in your vehicle type might be called by a third party as something else, but they've said it's the same as a limo 12 pass, or they've said it's, it's the same as a van 15 passenger, 13 passenger, whichever that is, or minibus 2631. So as you open up the bottom uh, uh, mapping down there, Brian, please. There you go. Um, these are the, the, the common uh, areas that when, when uh, a third party wants to book with you, so you don't get an area that you don't have a vehicle type mapped, that's what they're talking about. So anytime you get an error from one of your affiliates or from Limo Link or from Carrier and any of the others that I mentioned, GNET or, or uh, Deem, uh, that, that says, hey, uh, you don't have this vehicle type available to me. It's because you haven't mapped it. And one of the things I recommend, uh, click on back on this, the back grid. Uh, one of the things I always recommend is that if you uh, want to assign one of those items to there and you've got, say, uh, a, a, you're only running um, what I would call a corporate type sedan. If I were doing it, I would I would always map a standard sedan to that. I would book a corporate sedan to that. And if that corporate sedan could be considered luxury, I might even map a luxury sedan to that. I may have a different class for luxury. I don't, I don't know. But in other words, you don't want to miss out on third-party orders. And you would probably gladly, if you could get five extra orders a week, you'd probably gladly go ahead and um, book that. Uh, standard in a luxury or, or, or in a corporate just to take the order. Okay. That's all Brian. Okay. Uh, yeah, this is, it, it applies not only to the third parties, it also applies to the e affiliate. Um, if you're going to be sending amongst uh, other fast track users, um, Eddie explained it there. I, I call it the Rosetta stone of translating vehicle types um, in your system you may call it sedan S class in their system. They may call it luxury sedan. It's basically just translating what 
sedan S class equals sedan luxury. When it gets to their system, it will look to see what they have labeled their sedan luxury as and enable the reservation to be dropped into the system according to their vehicle type there. Now you can clear these, you can add others in there. Uh, as you see, if I go in here and say, I'll just call that a, a BMW, I can assign that. There's a primary one here and a secondary one. If I try to go in and assign it, it's going to ask me, is this the primary one or the secondary one? If I click on no, it now has two definitions to it. So you may have an affiliate that uh, calls it one thing and another affiliate that calls it something else. This allows you to send and or receive reservations back and forth between each other. Um, and again, since if they're trying to send you something called a sedan, but you have yours labeled as sedan S class, that thing needs to know what type of vehicle to book that reservation within your system. So it knows when it comes from their system to your system, it's looking for the S class. It'll create the reservation as an S class type vehicle in the reservation. All right. Um, anything else you can think of there, Eddie? I think I've covered most everything here, unless anybody has any questions on anything. I can't think of anything else. You, you might, uh, I don't know if you want to get into any pricing uh, tables that use these vehicle types. Um, uh, the, the warning also, there's, uh, you, Brian mentioned to you that you can either set a default price or not. And if you don't set the default price, the system's going to continue to bug you. It's going to bring up what some people call errors, but they're not. They're warnings that you have vehicle types that do not have, uh, that, that you've created that you haven't assigned a price to. And all that's trying to say is, um, I, I'm, a, I'm a reservationist, I'm trying to book an order, but I, I don't have no price for this. You know, I, I, there's nothing coming up, it's all zeros. And the reason for that is that as you create these, you have to think about down the road, where, where's this gonna show? It's gonna show on a reservation, as far as price, it's gonna show on online booking, it's gonna show on an invoice. So I need to go set a price for a type I set up, not just for booking, but also for pricing, reservation pricing, and billing pricing. Yes, I, I'll touch on the vehicle list here. Um, again, this is a much more detailed um, webinar about the pricing, um, as you'll see here in my default pricing. This list here is going to match this list that's located back in the vehicle types. Um, the message that Eddie was referring to, um, I don't think I can get any to kick up right now, but if you ever see this message pops up, uh, it says something to the effect of you have vehicles that do not have pricing associated to them. What you need to do is go to your pricing management area, down in the lower left, click on the add button, and it's telling me that I have all my vehicle types have been um, assigned pricing to it. However, if I did have some, the window behind it would allow me, it would give me the list of vehicle types that I had not assigned a price to. So again, keep in mind, if you add a new vehicle type uh, and you don't go in and set a price to it, you will get a message that says uh, you have vehicle types that do not have uh, pricing to them. Simply go to the menu pricing management, lower left, click on the add button, and you'll be able to add a default price to that vehicle. Now, there are instances where you may not know the prices of it. Um, for instance, you may not actually have a 20 to 25 passenger minibus because you're always farming it out or sending it out to other companies. It still needs to have a price associated to it. Um, you could simply put in a penny, that way you can still save the reservation, get the price from the uh, affiliate, and then enter it into the reservation if you don't know the prices ahead of time. Um, but even if it's a vehicle type that you don't have, but you still sell to your customers, you need to add it to the list of vehicle types and associate a price to it. Uh, as I said, it could be as simple as a penny that you are then later on um, getting the prices for it. Okay, now, any questions or are we good 
Anything else you want to add here, Eddie? I think I've covered pretty much everything on the setup, uh, where it's all used, the reservations, um, the dispatching stuff is we will discuss in more detail. But you know, the VIN numbers, the types, the mileage, the licenses, being able to add all those in there, your vehicle types, being able to add those, where you can get your reports, again, underneath the reporting area, um, your maintenance, maintenance cost analysis, and where these different vehicle types and vehicles are used within the program as well um, in customer profiles, as well as reservations and in the okay. pricing. Area. So we covered all those items there. Um, at the end of this uh, webinar, uh, just a reminder, you will be sent a uh, short survey. If you would please fill that out, um, you'll be uh, entered into the drawing to win the $50 gift card. Uh, it also helps us uh, get a better idea as to some of the topics that uh, you would like to cover in future uh, webinars, as well as our general sessions, which are coming up. Um, again, those will be uh, driven by those <laughs> various questions that we received and be a little bit more open forum than some of these, which are the uh, training ones right now. Um, we also, at the end of this, you're going to uh, get, receive a link that is to our future webinars. Please go in there and look, uh, sign up for any of those in the future. Uh, we still have sign up on some of them. We need to add the dates on future ones, but please go in and sign up for those uh, so you can see all the future webinars. As a reminder, don't forget to do your security updates. This was addressed in uh, one of the uh, first webinars. This has to do with updating your usernames to email addresses. Please remember, this is a must. This must be done for us to uh, send out any future updates. Uh, we are drawing close to those timeframes. Um, if you have any questions, please email us at support at fasttrackcloud.com and we can address your questions about those security updates as well as guide you which ones you still need to do. Okay, uh, if there's any questions or anything else like that, again, uh, about the security updates or any of the items we discussed today, please remember email us directly at support at fasttrack.cloud. We can answer them directly or if you need any guidance in the security update as well as the required.net update, let us know. We can send you instructions on those, but please send those to support at fasttrack.com. That will fasttrackcloud.com. Oh, fasttrackcloud.com. <laughs> that will conclude today's uh, webinar. We'll look forward to you next week. And um, for those of you going to Las Vegas in March for the limo show, we'll hope to see you there. Once we get our booth information and everything else like that, we'll send that out to everybody. Hopefully everybody has a good day. Thank you for attending and we'll look forward to you next week.